but we will start now with the presentations themselves by um, welcoming Dr. Wanjiro Kamau Rutenberg, who is member of the CEF International Advisory Bo uh, Board, and she is also member, I mean director, or of the African Women in Agricultural Research and Development Award. So please, Dr. Kamau Rutenberg. Thank you so much for having me. Let me see if, can you see my screen? Oops, let's see, I need to go back. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Fantastic, great. Um, it's such an honor to be here and to, to get to participate in this session. Um, and um, I'm really excited that Zef is moving forward um, really robustly with, with just such a rigorous approach to gender across, across the board. So um, it's certainly an exciting, exciting moment uh, for us to be in each other's lives. So um, I'm, I'm a little nervous that I'm going to be all over the place because I ended up finding out that I have a lot that I could talk about and I only have 15 minutes and I really want to only talk for 10 minutes so we can have at least some conversation. So please bear with me as I try and go uh, probably faster than I should have, uh, th than I should and um, Hopefully, I'm not too much all over the place. Um, I just want to start with the basics. I don't know how many of you um, have ever seen this. I just find it such a valuable tool to just begin a conversation about gender. Um, there's a link there. Just go look for the gender bread person. I just have always found it to be a really interesting and valuable tool to just have the basic conversation. So. Um, I'm going to be talking, I'll, um, it, it can be very easy to get terms confused, so um, I'm not going to go over this, take the time to go over this, but at least I wanted to share it with you just in case you, um, some of you haven't, haven't seen it. Um, so I want to start this conversation with just some, some, at least definitions from my side, how I understand things. Um, as academics, we're very aware that uh, definitions are up are contested and contestable and that actually might be the bread and butter of academics is to contest um, so t take it all with with that under advisement um, for me gender is not just about women I do believe and this is me making it up but I think at the heart of gender studies is working to understand the economies and ecologies of domination basically what we try and do with gender studies is to try and understand what and who is it allowable to conquer, to dominate, to penetrate, to annex, and why. Um, that is just a simple definition I came up with for myself that helps me understand or um, ground myself in what, what are we to doing about, uh, what is gender studies about, what's the, the core mission of gender studies. Um, there's two particular ways that I think are really important and that I have found useful. Um, um, in the literature in terms of understanding gender studies. One is gender as a social construct. I think a lot of you will be familiar with this. This is where we talk about the roles, the responsibilities, expectations, rights, privileges, entitlements, exclusions assigned to different types of people. Um, now, I'm kind of curious this might be too basic for, for people in the room. I wasn't quite sure the range of, um, of familiarity or ex deep expertise on the topic. So forgive me if this is too basic for you. Um, a, a second way that I have found useful to look at gender is gender as performance. Um, and it's quite similar to gender as a social con construct, but rather um, the social construct idea talks about it, it, how we think of gender, whereas gender's performance is how we do gender. Um, and this, this popular, the idea was popularized by Judith Butler in her book, Gender Trouble, which is a fantastic, fantastic book, highly recommend, um, where, where really the idea is that gender is inscribed in daily practices learned and performed based on cultural norms of femininity and masculinity. And again, Judith, Judith Butler's book, Gender Trouble, is just a fantastic 
fantastic uh, place to start. For me, these two images um, get start to get to the practical hurt of wh what do we mean when we're saying gender is a social construct. Um, on the top picture, you have a woman, this was, you know, up until a few years ago, two, three years ago, I believe. Um, this is a Saudi woman breaking the law. She is behind the wheel of a car and she is driving. And up until a few years ago, that was absolutely illegal. Women were not allowed to drive. Um, the picture below is um, a group of an all-female crew um, of uh, Royal Brunei Airlines, I believe it was, that flew big old jet into Saudi Arabia um, and then had to be driven home. And so when we're talking about um, that social construct, you can fly a big jet into our country, but you can't drive a car to your hotel. Um, and what that these two pictures just remind me of is that that the idea of gender is socially constructed in that, um, but very real. There's a temptation to imagine that things that are socially constructed are not real, um, which is not true. And so you may even be physically capable of driving a car, but in this society, you shall not. That when we go back to when I'm talking about the uh, limitations, right? Like here, the rights, privileges, entitlements, ex and exclusions. Yes, you may be able to do it, but thou shalt not is at the heart of gender and how gender rules. So I want to, in the chat really quickly, um, I would love to hear what are some examples in your society where there is a thou shalt not that's based on gender. I know in some societies, um, women are not allowed to eat chicken or certain parts of, for example, in my society, in my particular ethnic community, women are not allowed to eat the head of a goat. Now, I happen to not have a particular interest in that part of the meat anyway, so I'm okay, but um, we have, we do end up in situations where you've got serious nutritional imbalances because women are not consuming certain nutrients because culture um, prohibits that. Now, there's something about this. I, I thought I could see the chat. Wait, is anyone saying anything? Come on. Someone chat something. Ah, there we go. Oh, I love it. Expected to be mothers, but they shall not walk in the streets at night not Catholic priests. Uh, women don't build the family house. Um, whereas for Irene, we know that in Kenya, in the Maasai culture, it's actually women's work to build the house, right? So that's, there's a sum of those, that social construct, the, I, the, the pro prohibitions, um, speak to understanding the pro understanding which prohibitions speak to um, understanding the socially constructed nature of, of gender as performance. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on. Oh, okay. A little provocation. I have this idea and perhaps I'm wrong. Um, I'd love to hear what you think, maybe at the end of this talk, that European societies have a long, hundreds of years long culture of women not being scientists. And the low numbers of women in senior research across Western Europe in particular is actually um, as a result of those gender norms. I'd be curious to hear what you think. I'm trying to provoke some folk here. Okay. So, gender studies, next I want to talk about, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, uh, I want to talk about next gender studies from an African perspective. Um, 
And in particular, I want to argue that gender studies is improved, I think, and made more relevant, especially to the African African contextual problems, uh, when you when it takes on an African, a distinctly African flavor. Um, I want and and the, again, some of this, a lot of this, is me making it up. But I want to argue. Well, here, this is a fact, and then I'm going to make my argument. Um, it's a fact that at the insistence of black women led by Kimberly Crenshaw, um, a name that you should all know, there's her picture, gender studies, when it is done well, when it is done properly, is actually intersectional in that we end up considering the intersection of gender identity with other identities such as race, class, religion, ETC, in shaping lived experiences. I heard um, Dennis talk about intersectionality, it's in the strategy. I am assuming you're having a lot of conversations at Zef about what exactly is intersectionality and how do we deploy it in, in, in our research uh, in effective ways. Now, here's the argument that I want to make. I want to argue that gender studies with an African lens brings a keen awareness of the role of colonialism in destabilizing gender relations across Africa. And the real provocation that I want to bring is I want to argue that the colonial state offered African men the op option or opportunity to dominate African women as a way of um, soothing the colonial experience. And the, the behind that, what I'm really saying is that the colonial experience so fundamentally raptured and dislocated social relations in Afri in, pre in um, newly colonized African societies. That's one, one point I'm making. Second, it wasn't just a di disruption. It was a disruption that took mutually beneficial social relations and turned them into hierarchical. So you had people, that, uh, men and women living like this and the colonial experience introduced a hierarchy that remains, I think, to this day, um, the bane and the unfinished work of decolonization. Um, and as such, I then want to argue that gender studies with an African lens cannot afford to forget or ignore the de deeply destabilizing um, impact of that colonial experience. And that is another intersecting lens that must that that must be added to the identities. I want to basically what I'm doing is layering the colonial experience into um, into that intersectionality and saying a truly intersectional approach that looks at African challenges must bear in mind the role of the colonialism in destabilizing and in uh, disrupting gender relations on the continent. I also want to argue that um, gender studies, when done from a, an African perspective, also has a very libera liberatory potential. It has potential for liberation. It has potential to offer up ways to build better, more equal societies. Um, I, I think that the ideologies that drive the exploitation of the Earth's resources, and I'm going to, oh, okay. I should have. Uh, so you're going to see me start to move into a conversation about climate change. Um, and this is uh, agricultural research and climate change. Um, this is why I am saying I'm kind of all over the place, but just 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 go with me. Um, I want to argue that the ideologies that drive the exploitation of the Earth's resources are the same ideologies that drive the exploitation of women, of black people and all that are deemed other. Um, that this idea that you go to a place, you find people, you deem them other, and the, uh, their othering then gives you the power that you need to, um, to, to dominate. Um, it, it's the same approach, it's the same ideology, it's the same way of thinking. And I want to link that way of thinking um, approaching whether it's women, whether it's people of color, or the earth and its resources um, to the challenges that we are, are facing. 
Um, I think that the liberatory potential of gender studies when done from an African perspective actually comes from how African gender studies reminds us of how racial politics has undermined those practices in parts of historical Africa that had a complementary that had complementary elements and that nurtured a spirit of mutuality, including Ubuntu. Um, and this, this is what I said earlier in the, in the last slide. I, I don't know how many of you are, I, I'm hoping or assuming uh, many of you are familiar with this idea of Ubuntu. I am because you are. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm seeing folks no, nodding. Um, I'm loving the visual cues, by the way, because I'm seeing no one is chatting. So I don't, I'm, I'm also keeping an eye on the chat in case anyone wants to communicate with me that way. Okay, Ubuntu is this idea that, um, I'm gonna do, let me do this really sloppily. Um, yeah, I'm gonna be really sloppy about it and argue that Western culture is very individual. When you, individualistic, um, if you look at the kind of the hero story, the he, in, in literature is a great place to, to understand what's happening and how society sees itself and, and is, is structured. Um, the, the Western hero story is young man goes into forests, um, encounters challenges, fights the bear and re-emerges back into the village a hero. Um, you know, like add flavor to that, but it's it's individual goes through tough times and reemerges victorious, setting him up to have the moral authority to do X Y Z. Um, and I would argue, and some work to read is Achille Mbembe. I'll post it in the chat. Um, he, I think, does some of the best. He's a, a, a Congolese philosopher who does a really good job of explaining an, an African ontology, if you will. Um, that is, there is no individual without society. And that the production of the self is in relation to intention with, in support of, and in the context of society. And if, if you're coming from that approach, you have a very different, um, it's a very different underpinning and a very different um, approach to, to everything, right? It's a different approach to how you extract resources, how you use resources. The earth, the, the forests, the land isn't just for you to benefit and profiteer. Um, it is communal property. A lot of our societies didn't have this concept of you can own a piece of land. That's a foreign, truly a foreign concept for a lot of African cultures. Um, and, and again, there's all the, that colonial disruption changes absolutely everything, including how you see the self as as being constructed and as emerging. Um, a quick example, um, in Shona, um, most widely spoken language in Zimbabwe, the way you say good morning, you say Mangwanani, um, and Mamuka say, how have you woken up? And the response is, Ndamuka kana mamukao, which is, I've woken up the way you have woken up, or how you have woken up. It is to say, if you're good, I'm good. My well-being is fully dependent on your and interlinked to your well-being. That is a concept of Ubuntu. Um, and the argument I'm making is that the colonial moment disrupted that in really fundamental ways. And an African gender studies approach will recognize that and integrate the post-colonial healing that needs to happen into analysis of gender relations in society today. Um, ooh, okay, African gender studies also teaches us, and this is where I think the magic really is, that tradition and culture are pot a potent resource that can adapt so that rather than having African societies stagnate at the moment of colonial interruption, we recognize powerful opportunities to build resilient African modernities. 
what I'm arguing is that bringing an African lens to gender studies is not just about retaining ancient culture and holding on to the past. It is actually a powerful liberatory tool that would allow us to imagine potential for adaptation, adoption, and um, opportunities to build what I'm calling resilient African modernities. Um, and I will be sharing the, these, these slides um, with you, so you don't need to furiously uh, note. Um, okay, so now let me make a pivot into, so I've done a lot of talking about theory, um, which I love, I'm a political theorist, like that's really fun for me. But let's go into some more practical things. So let's talk about, I, I, I think, I believe climate change is one of the conversations or, or, or areas of research that is quite, quite um, big at ZEF. So let's, let's get, try and get a bit more practical about gender and climate change in Africa and, and what, do we learn anything new? Do we do things differently if we bring gender and an African, a gender lens and an African lens to research on climate change? So this, this is basic. I'm going to go really quickly through it. Um, it's a fact that due to their socially prescribed roles and because they make up a larger percentage of the poor and the vulnerable, women in Africa have been among the first to notice the impact of climate change and its effects on the agricultural cycle, on human and animal life, food production and food security. African women also end up being major custodians and frontline consumers of natural resources. Think firewood, then think water, think use of forests. Um, the lives of African women, especially those in rural areas, have been profoundly affected by the seasonal changes um, um, that are part of climate change, making them among the most vulnerable to climate change. And at the same time, the most poor and the most vulnerable, we as a global community have decided that they are the ones who should carry the greatest burden for adaptation and mitigation. It doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. Um, but there are ways that we're structuring policy, that we're structuring development programs that actually puts the onus of additional labor on African women and on the poorest, most affected African women to be the ones who deliver um, uh, um, on the adaptation and uh, especially adaptation um, designs that we have. Okay, uh, well-known fact, 37% of the population is 30 minutes or more away from safe drinking water source. Who do you think is securing that? It's going to be the women who are walking further and further to go access um, safe drinking water for their families. Africa's agricultural sector, which is where I'm really located, um, is particularly vulnerable to climate change, yet it remains a major driver of gender inequality on the continent, where we see, for example, 62% of economically active African women are working in the sector, yet the rural wage gap between men and women on the continent is sorry, estimated as somewhere between 15 to 60 percent. Women in Ethiopia providing 75 percent of the labor to produce coffee, but they're only earning 34 percent of the income generated. So I'm, con I'm, I'm working here to connect a whole bunch of dots around climate change, sucks it sucks for women climate change sucks it sucks for the agricultural sector which already sucks for women so gender um climate change as experienced in africa is highly gendered that's the main point that i'm i'm making um it's not a neutral phenomenon we do and my the organization that i i run uh, award african women in agricultural research and development um does believe that there is a promise of gender responsive agricultural research. Um, and, and for us, gender responsive agricultural research is research that responds to the needs and the priorities of a diversity of women and men across agri Africa's agricultural value chains. And so I'm going to just, if you think about 
um, and here I'm trying to bring that these highly kind of theoretical concepts of gender down to the practicalities. If you think about an agricultural ecosystem or an agricultural research system, um, whether it's animal, you know, animal welfare, crop breeding, um, or whatever kind of agricultural research um, that's happening, what are the ways that these research agendas address the needs of each of these people. You can't say, and then, and actually, let me challenge you, not just the agricultural research sector, let me challenge you um, as ZEF researchers. If you're doing research that's supposed to benefit Africans, which Africans are you working to benefit? Which Africans is, which category here is your research most relevant to? Because bringing a gender lens to that research will help you be very clear. Um, for when I, when I make this presentation to um, agricultural research uh, leaders, I'll use the example of, um, let me do tomatoes. How much time do I have? How, how badly am I doing? Oh um, sorry, Dr. Kamau. Yeah, maybe you can wrap up your presentation. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'll skip that. Oh, my word. Okay. Mm. Gender responsive agricultural research, uh, African responses to climate change must, one, prioritize and center African experiences and priorities. They must remain intersectional and not fall into the trap of homogenizing African women or even Africans themselves attempt it must attempt to wrestle with Africans colonial wounds while recognizing that there's no going back to a grand old past um, and I just love this quote by Karl Marx about women, um, men well I say women too making their own history but not and um, not um, not as they please but under circumstances already existing um, I wanted to get I'll, I'll wrap up here. I wanted to have a couple, um, have a couple more slides on how we at AWARD are trying to bring gender into the praxis um, of one of the fellowships that we are running that is um, a, a $20 million initiative working with 600 scientists from across Africa and Europe, early career scientists, and supporting these early career scientists to bring a gender lens into their climate research, um, and in particular into their climate adaptation research. Um, but I think I, think I, I was overly ambitious, so I'm going to wrap up there um, and hope that we can have, um, have a conversation.